time for your daily dose of all things Chicago sports. This is The Daily Score. Now, here's your host, Mark Grody. Hello again, everybody, and welcome into The Daily Score. I am Mark Grody. Thank you for joining us today. I just literally just got off the radio with Hub Arkish and Gabe Ramirez, and man, it is the the disagreements that exist in terms of Justin Fields and whether he is the guy or not are real. What we all agreed on in that room was that Justin Fields played very well. And, you know, Hub's stance was, yeah, he played really well, but he couldn't do it at the end. He couldn't win it at the end. My argument on that is that kind of did put them in position to win the game on the Tyler Scott pass after the two bad plays previous to that. Um, and there's some culpability on field for the decisions he made on those RPO plays. But I thought that this was a complete game for Justin Fields and even the strip sack safety at the end. That was just a big time play by Aiden Hutchinson. I'm sorry. And it was not even bad um, right tackling on the side by Darnell Wright, the right tackle just got beat by a really good player. So that's just something that's going to continue to simmer. We're not going to bust that out completely here in this podcast because I want you to hear from a couple of people. Uh, We're going to hear from Jaquan Brisker and Chase Daniel on this program. We'll start with Jaquan Brisker. And speaking of that, I think Jaquan Brisker is going to back up my stance on this. And that is that, that Fields gave the team every opportunity to win. Justin gave us the chance to win. Um, I thought he played well. I texted him. I told him that was on the defense, and, and it truly was. Like I said, they gave us that late field goal at the end to put us up two touchdowns. Defense has to close that out. There's there's no – there's nothing else you could say. There's no excuse. There's nothing. No, he played so well. Um, he was a great leader. His energy was contagious. You you just tell, you know, him coming back. You no, know, he was just different. In the pass game, in the pocket, um, getting out of the pocket, delivering great balls, um, throwing it behind the receiver so he wouldn't get hit too hard. Like his ball placements, just it was just different with him out there. And you know, I was just so disappointed that we couldn't get the win for him. When he got the first down, that was a huge first down in that point of game. It was like six five. It was like what six minutes. Um, clock was ticking. Maybe yeah, six minutes. Clock was ticking. Um, and when he got that first down and then he kept going, then he got past mid- midfield. Um, to me, I, I thought it was over right there. Um, I knew we still had to go out there and play great defense, but you know, I thought, you know, after that, you know, it was, it was for surely over whether we get a field goal or rather we punch in their score or maybe we just run out the clock a little bit more. Um, you know, whatever it is, you know, I thought when he got that first down, it was, it was, it was going to be over because at that point it was 23-14, clock running, clock turning. Our offense is dominating them. The offense was dominating them. Um, it, like when they won and two, they were getting down the field, you know, fast, especially when it was in Justin, Justin's hands. Um, Justin was for sure – when the ball was in his hands, he was for surely making plays for us, and I thought it was over right there. <laughs> so wait a minute. This answers a lot of questions for me, Ray, and that is – Apparently the defense thought the game was over. That's that's what happened right there. I think Jaquan Brisker said it four times. Thought the game was over. I think that they were out there on the field, and that's what they were saying to themselves. We thought the game is the game over. No, the game's not. It's not. Jalen Johnson and Eddie Jackson. The game is not over. What is that coverage? So that's what happened. Okay, I didn't expect to get that kind of clarity from Jaquan Brisker, uh, but for real. He's right. I mean, he kept saying, too, about Justin Fields, that Justin Fields was just different. And he did look – he looked like a guy who got a few weeks to sit sit back, relax, or a couple of weeks and heal and think and, you know, freshen up, all that. So he, he looked terrific, I thought. He, Jaquan Brisker mentioned his ball placement, the running. It was all good. But uh, at least we have cracked the riddle of what the hell was going on in the defense. They thought it was over, just like the rest of us. Uh, um, let's go to one more Brisker cut here. Brisker, despite what is uh, going down with his team, three and eight, 
he still thinks there's something to this team? I always have confidence in my teammates, in my team, in my coaches. Um, so it's always going to be a yes answer for me, no matter what, no matter if we're over, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I always have confidence in my guys. So, um, I'm for sure, for sure going to ride and die with my team. So I definitely believe we have, you know, confidence to finish this thing out the right way. All right. All right. And you know what? Jaquan Brisker has been like that all along. He's always like, you know, highly spirited in that way. He was that way last year. He was that way this year. It's not going to happen this year, but I do appreciate the confidence coming out of Jaquan Brisker, who was a guest on the Bernstein and Holmes show right here on The Score. Let's get to to Chase Daniel. And Chase Daniel talked about Justin Fields as well. Let's find out from him just how good he thought it was. I did think it was his best game as a Bear. There's a couple reasons why. The first reason, uh, it was against that defense on the road, hostile environment, which you never used to think we would say in Detroit, a hostile environment even three or four years ago. But that just tells you how much Dan Campbell's changed that organization. Um, but it was how he played, how he did it, how he got through his progressions. He was sped up, but he was under control when he was sped up. There's this play to Cole Komet that Cole, it, it's like a six-yard completion. Cole turns it up and gets like 12 where he's looking to the field as his number one read. It's a hitch to DJ Moore. It's taken away. He comes into a stick route, taken away. He gets to his third progression, but he does it in a way that is on time and in rhythm. And um, it was a different arm angle than I've seen him have. Like he, he has a rocket arm. Like he has a very strong arm, but I had yet to see a lot of different plays where he was creative with the way that he threw the football and love the game plan. Love the fact that they got him on the move on bootlegs and nuggets early in the game. He was thrown really well to his left, which I had yet to see. And it just looked like he was calm, uh, more calm than I had probably seen him. And, and my favorite play of the game is a long run down the left sideline. And you think they're going to ice the game. It's like a 30-yard run. And he gets up, and he just does this, like, shimmy, shimmy shake. And I'm like, dude, that is awesome like where has that been where has that confidence level been where has that fun been it seems like he had been trapped in sort of a shell of his and, and you just hope that he uses this as a stepping stone for these next few games all right chase daniel also during that mentioned the arm and the throwing part of it that's where i want to get more specific because I, look the, the game i did think the game plan was good but but luke gets until it wasn't obviously towards the end. Like I love the, the specific types of run plays that they were using in this game and fields keeping and the disguising and the fakes were just really good, really good. But let's hear what Chase Daniel has to say about fields development with his arm. He climbed the pocket while keeping his eyes downfield chase in some ways that we haven't seen that much. It seems like that was Perhaps a, a dedicated choice to tuck and look for receivers as opposed to tuck and run. How hard must that be for uh, an incredibly mobile quarterback like that? Well, well I, I think it's hard for a mobile quarterback, but I think it's hard for Justin because he just hasn't really trusted himself in times like those to make that big throw down the field. Because you're talking about the second and 21 to DJ Moore. Because he the way he stepped up into the pocket, and I pause it, And make sure you guys go ahead and watch that breakdown because it was impressive the way that he was able to go out there and do that. And that play, I pause it and I circle. You cannot see another defender on the field. He could have run for 25 yards. He could have run for 25 yards. And sometimes that's the best thing. But he stepped up, set his feet, and launched it to DJ Moore. And the ball was an absolute dime. Like, perfect. Like, not a lot of separation. He beat him. It, you don't really think of post routes and man-to-man, but he trusted his guy. He got it, and he could have run, but he didn't. And that just tells me that there's a little bit of growth because in the past, and, and maybe the few early games of this year, especially last year, if number one wasn't open, he was taken off and running no matter what. And so that to me is saying, hey, growth, seeing what we have with this arm. And you could see that was sort of the catalyst and that confidence building throw that he needed because he'd missed a few weeks. Sometimes it takes a few drives, but they were right on, especially from that first drive. That first drive was really impressive too, honestly. Yeah. First drive. I mean, after the first drive, I think what I tweeted out was that was awesome. Now let's essentially, let's see it again. Cause we've seen 
honestly, we've seen a lot of really good first drives for the Bears this year. The Bears have looked good early in games, like really good, and then it crumbles. It just happened to wait, take until the fourth quarter to crumble this time around. So, And, yeah, I noticed that, too, you know, stepping up in the pocket, the little sidearm sling, that was good to see. And that was, you know what that is? That's presence of mind, and that's not something Justin Fields has particularly been good at. Or I don't know if you can be good at presence of mind. It's You either have it in those moments or you don't. I thought Justin Fields had presence of mind in that game better than, I don't want to say every single game he's played. I'd have to go back and look. But as good as I've seen him in that regard in terms of, you know, feeling the pressure, knowing when to get rid of the football, there were still times when he took too much time to get rid of the football. But for the most part, he was better at it. Um, and you know how I feel about the strip sack safety. Or maybe you don't because maybe I was just talking about that with uh, with Gabe and Hub. Um, that was just a great play by Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, that was a really good play. So I I give the Lions the thumbs up on that more than I give the Bears the thumbs down on that final play. Final cuts for this podcast, and I, I have not heard the answer to this, but this is one that I'm looking forward to hearing more than any of these, and that is, here we go now. People, we're, we've been talking about the will the Bears draft a quarterback this year because they will have a high draft pick. Don't know where it's going to be, but the question to Chase Daniel on the Parkinson Spiegel show, is Fields a better option than drafting a quarterback. What you've put on film up to this point matters, but it's a what have you done for me lately, Lee. And and if you watch the breakdown, I title it, Justin Fields is here to stay. Because I truly believe, and I tweeted out that went viral a couple days ago when I was watching the game. I'm like, you're crazy right now if you don't think that the brass of the Chicago Bears and Ryan Poles is not using this game to think that Justin Fields is their guy. Because 100% they are. They want to be right. They want to be right, even though they didn't, they didn't have him. Like, they want him to be the guy. And I think... A lot of people want him to be the guy um, because, like, he's a, he can be a really good player. Like, wouldn't you love to figure out, okay, going into this offseason, Justin Fields is our guy. We feel comfortable with him moving forward. And you can pick at one and five. There's a guy named Marvin Harrison Jr. that's out there. There's a couple offensive tackles that are out there. Wouldn't you love to have him rather than starting over with the quarterback? And if they draft a quarterback, so be it. Doesn't necessarily mean Justin Fields' time is over there. But I think that – at this juncture and what we've seen so far now, it could change in the next five games that Justin Fields is a better option right now than Caleb Williams or Drake May. I think at the moment, probably right. I, you know, I mean, it feels like Caleb Williams' stock has just gone way down relative to where he was like generational talent. That's that, that part seems out the door. Well, he, could he possibly still be the number one overall pick? Absolutely. Um, Drake may all of a sudden, he started to bounce up. Then he didn't have a great game last week. So at the moment, it's hard to disagree. But I still think Fields has a long way to go. I will just say that, that you know the famous final seven games of evaluation for Justin Fields, that's one in the win column. So that you know six more to go. If he keeps playing like that, then I will be on team Justin Fields. I mean, right now, I don't think he's the future of the Chicago Bears. I think he could still be around next year, but keep playing like that, man, and I I will change my mind. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Ray Diaz, our executive producer. I am Mark Grody, and I will talk to you tomorrow on The Daily Score.